Hey, everyone. All right. Um, so I've been working with penetration testers most of my career, and I've worked with engineering teams that have a fairly high level of security maturity and teams that are just kind of starting out on their journey. And I noticed that both, both these groups of teams, you know, have problems working with pen testers, have trouble running a really good engagement. So I got to thinking about why this was, and I set out on finding ways to fix it. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I came to these conclusions and what I did. Um, so a little about me. My name's Brendan Serup. Uh, I go by the Nick Sparkle Ops. I currently work as a application security specialist. Before that, I did security analyst and PCI compliance stuff. Um, but the majority of my career, I've been a QA tester and a you know a senior QA, and I've mixed that with you know banking, payments, insurance, healthcare, and even a bit of critical infrastructure work, which is the one of the stories I'm going to tell you about today. And I also work very briefly in hardware R&D. So I've done a mix of things, work with pen testers across. Uh, pretty much all of those kind of projects. Um, a little as a little side, I also founded a threat hunting group known as Threat Safari, which you're going to hear um, Chris talk a little bit about what we do later on today. Um, we're protecting large New Zealand organizations and helping disclose what we find to our lovely friends at CERT, much love CERT. And uh, I help run the um, New Zealand InfoSec, um, InfoSec NZ Slack channel. So I'm going to talk about running a good penetration test um, with your team, and just look at the fact that, you know, penetration testers are kind of operating somewhat isolated from the people that build the software and the kind of problems that this is, this is causing us. Um, because they're separate, it means that I, what I see is a, um, a poor shared context uh, and understanding of the systems that they're both working on. And we're going to talk about how they close that gap and how you will know that if you try some of the things that I'm suggesting, how you'll actually see signs that your teams are succeeding in making this work better. So starting off with a little bit of a story about how I discovered this myself. Um, I'm going to go all the way back to about 2007 when I was a, when I was a software tester. Um, I was well on the way to becoming a senior QA. I was kind of an intermediate QA. Um, my boss like to put me on some of the more interesting projects because I had really good exploratory testing skills. Like I was able to decompose a system really quickly, do good kind of exploratory testing. And I'd often be able to back that up with um, doing some of the automated testing and some of the performance testing as well. Like I was able to go a bit beyond the standard manual testing that they were doing. So she calls me into her room and says, hey, um, got something a little bit more interesting. You know, would like to put you on this project where we want you to test a um, gas power plant provisioning system. I'm like, OK, that's, you know, that kind of sounds interesting. Um, so what this system did was you would put in some coordinates on a map and say, I want gas pipes to go from power plant through to this new suburb. And that will provision this suburb with gas. Um, the system would spit out a couple of files and say, right, these are the kind of pipes you need, this is the kind of stuff that's going to go back to make the network understand that this works. But it would also roll out a bunch of like works order management system stuff to help them buy all the bill of materials, to get the contractors, diggers, all that kind of stuff. It would actually help automate all that very laborious part of the business. Um, technical side, they didn't give us too much. They said, yeah, there's some GIS lookups and a whole bunch of gas network load stuff, but don't worry. Um, you know, we're going to give you a really, really precise spec, so you're going to know how how this works. It won't, you know, it won't be too much of a challenge for you. So, like, okay, great, cool. Um, when I was testing, these were waterfall projects, so they would give me specs that say, especially like critical infrastructure, that say this is how this will work. It will not do anything else. It will do this. When you when you give us a system at the end, it will produce this and nothing else. And it's very much um, being brought in at the end on a waterfall project and being told, like, test the quality in, tell us when it's done, tell us when we're you know, good to upload it into our UAT environment and have a look for ourselves. Um, so you know, if you're not familiar, waterfall, um, it kind of hops from silo to silo. So you have planning, design, it's being handed over to development, and then they hand it over to QA. And then right at the end 
over into ops. Maybe security gets to look in, maybe they don't. <laughs> anyway, um, so that's, that's what had happened to me. The developers had kind of done their thing, they'd read the spec and they'd gone, okay, wicked. Over to you testing, right at the end here, Merry Christmas. Tell if it's, if it's, if it's good or not. So I'm like, woohoo, this is, this is what I love to do. Um, I get exploratory testing and I go around and I start punching in orders and building pipelines and spinning up works orders and all that kind of thing and just figuring out kind of where the boundaries of the system work and, and how it all hangs together. And then I use the spec to make a manual test plan. This is the, that's the, you know, kind of the way we did things back then. And so that I had traceability, the client say, you give me requirement 1.1, I have test 1.1 to prove that this is the case or you know, that, that, that I've understood this. Um, and once we got through that, once I'd done sort of the manual testing and I had what I felt was you know, proven good due diligence on the system, I started to automate some of the more repeatable stuff because like you put in an address and it spits out a couple of files. I like don't want to sit there just typing out an address one, two, three again and again and again. So I, you know, run up a couple of scripts and was able to keep pumping out different orders for just different random addresses. Um, so that's, that's kind of cool. So I get that all humming and I'm like, yes, yes, success. I can see orders coming through. I can see gas network stuff happening. Um, and it matches the spec. Like I, I just have this have the sense like it was all it was all traceable, it was all aligned, and I'm a really good exploratory tester. Like I've even found I think I've found some of the weird edge case stuff and that kind of thing. So I go to my boss, I'm like, hey, I think we're done. I think we're good. I show her the test exit report, and she's like, You really have thought this through. You really do understand the software that we've built, and I, you know, I, I'm I'm pretty pleased. And I'm feeling good about it too. Like I'm, I'm really proud of what I do as a QA engineer. I think, yep, we, we've got this. So he just says, all right, tell the devs to put this on the client's UAT environment. And we'll just, you know, we'll wait for the call and they'll say, you guys have done such an amazing job. <laughs> or not, <laughs> as the case may be. So within about five, 10 minutes, the client rings us and says, basically, what the fuck? Like, what are you doing? Uh, this, this is a mess. We've been in your system about 10 minutes, and we've found like two to three P1s and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I'm like, OK, that's not great. That's not what I like to hear. Um, like, get you, you get on the call with a dev lead and your boss. You get in a conference call. We want to talk. I'm like, oh, OK. This is, this, is, this is not good. Um, on the way through, I talked to the developers, and I'm like, guys, they're saying it's full of P1s. And they're like, no, it's not. What, are you, what a load of crap. Like, this is just like the spec. We built the thing. They asked for the thing, we built the thing. The developers are like, don't know what you're talking about. So we're on the call, and this, you know, the client's absolutely spewing at my boss, saying, I, just, I don't you know, we're trusting you with this very, very sensitive project, and whatever else, and she's like, I just don't understand what your problem is. Like, this works. This, this, is, this, is, what, this is better than what you wanted. And they're going, no, it's not. And she's like, all right, run us through some of the stuff that you found. Like, just, just try and calm down and explain the kind of stuff that, you, that you're seeing in the system. So like, all right, first of all, we noticed that Brendan runs automated tests amongst our environment. And he's run, like, a test for 69 Chesterfield Way in Oriwa, and he's done it 300 times. I'm like, yeah, and it produces the same output every time. Like, what more could you want? And she was like, duplicate detection, maybe? And I was like, oh. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah, because that project cost you a couple of hundred million dollars. And <laughs> uh, right, duplicate detection. Wasn't in the spec, but when you think about it, when you know the the way these things work, you're like, yeah, that makes sense. That wasn't the worst. That wasn't my worst sin. So when I was talking about gas network load stuff, there was uh, one of the values that came out in that flat file was like a load value. And when I was testing, I was like, OK, I'll try load value of 1. Works. Try a load value of minus 1. That also works. Try a load value of 2. Nope. Uh, OK, so it's got to be between 1 and minus 1. But for my automated testing, I did a load value of one. I was like, fuck it, right, one. And it went, and they said, 
Brendan, when you, when you provision a gas network, you're going from very, very big pipes at the gas station and stepping them down. That's the idea. So you're taking, you know, you kind of, as you go, as you stage down through the system, you're taking load off the network. So those should be minus values. And I was like, ah. Oh. So he's like, so when you ran like 3,000 automated tests with a load value of one, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He's like, you've killed so many people right now. And I'm like, <laughs> shit. OK, yeah. All right. So millions of dollars worth of damage, dead bodies, fire. Like, this is probably a no-go for production, I'm guessing, guys. They're like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, not a good, not a good day for me. Um, and that's when the client said to me, did you even test this at all? Can you imagine what that feels like? If you're like a proud QA engineer or a pen tester, you, might, you know, pen testers may have had this. They said, did you even look at this? Like, what, what are you doing? It, it, was, it was probably one of the worst days in my career as a, as a QA person. And my boss is looking at me going, have I hired a complete fool? Like, how did, how did he not see this? Um, and this is where we ended up. Just me at odds with my boss, trying to defend my position. My boss, like, trying to defend our position with the client. The client just still spewing, and quite rightly so. Um, it was a really, really bad time. So it turns out my client had never worked with a professional uh, QA tester before. They didn't actually know what QA testers did. They didn't know how that engagement worked. I just did something very magical to ensure that that system was OK. And I'd spit a report out at the end of it and be like, here's your amazing software. They were actually very impressed with my methodology, with my automation and everything else. But they're like, how did you manage to actually screw this up so badly? And we were both, you know, we're both at the far extremes of cooperating with each other. And it's very expensive to run a relationship that way. Um, so my exploratory testing like QA skills didn't save me. You know, duplicates, fireballs, and what have you. And both parties are a bit like, how did this, how did this even happen? Because in Waterfall, you write a really prescriptive spec. So then the penny drops to the client. He's like, Brendan. How many gas networks have you provisioned or set up in your life? I'm like, Dave, it's probably close to none. <laughs> He's like, yeah, that's actually fair. He's like, so you're a software guy, and you know, you, 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 this is not your industry. This is not your daily. I'm like, yeah. So he's like, well, let's, let's actually fix that. So he says, we'll do some screen sharing. They sent me some project plans. They, we did some more, more peer testing, and they sent me their acceptance plan. And I actually started to understand the business context as much as the technical context that I needed to do my job. And all the subsequent builds, I was able to iron out you know, quite a lot of the, the silly kind of mistakes or actually understand what might be bad in a, in a gas power plant going wrong or, or, or in a rollout. And the relationship improved, the software improved, and my ability to execute as a tester improved. So we, like, that, was the, that was the story, that was the event where you know, we weren't working well together, we weren't handing over the context, and this was the result. I'm going to fast forward us now to, to modern day. We're actually much better at building software, because we've got agile teams. Hooray. Um, so we've solved all our problems. <laughs> there are some good things about agile teams, though. Like If you see the way agile teams cooperate, um, Especially with testers, they're shifting left throughout the whole process if I'm to just to focus in on QA people. And they say, you know, the, the testers are involved from design through to right through to production support. Um, we're getting, seeing the emergence of SRE and, and DevOps culture where we're sharing more and unlocking the information. And I suppose if you to boil it down to any one thing, it's like a, a faster and more frequent feedback, feedback loop between the teams. We're becoming a lot better at understanding each other's context and having empathy for the different roles and whatever else that, you know, that people do to make this, and we're realizing it's a team sport. Penetration testing, though. The majority, in my experience, has been handing this over at the end. We're like, we're about to ship a bill to production, so we better ring our, our pen testers and get the two weeks booked in to find out if it's broken or not. Um, 
engineering teams have actually never really been trained to work with penetration testers and understand their context and understand what matters. And the final product bill is being tossed over to pen testers like it's waterfall. And, and as somebody who supports engineering teams and pen testers, I see this. There's huge gaps. And it's just, you know, it's, it's no different to the gas network testing example that I've, that I've kind of just spelled out. This is what made it so clear to me. I was like, of course, you know, I was separate from the client, just, just like the, the pen testers are. So the other thing you've got to, you know, the context is not being handed, handed over, but I also want to focus in on the fact that engineering teams I see don't often have the, have the ability to understand what penetration testers need to do their work and what, what does this look like. So it sneaks up on engineering teams at the end of a project. You know, your project manager comes in and is like, by the way, your stuff's being penetration tested in like two weeks. So give them all the, the, the list of demands, set everything up for them. And these teams are just crunching out to get their MVP out or, you know, meet their final sprint, sprint deadlines. And they're not actually enabled to, to, do, a, to do a good handover. Um, and the poor setup means that you're going to have issues right from scoping the pen test through to your remediation. Um, penetration testers haven't believed me when I've said this, but I see this, and it does still happen. There is a certain sense of fear in project teams that you're being audited, that, you're, that your code's going to be under review, and you might be perceived as poor engineers if you, you, know, you, ha you have uh, security issues if something's going to ship late. And it manifests itself in some really counterproductive behavior, which as an application security specialist, I actually have to help kind of teams uh, you know, overcome. So I'll give you just a few examples. You get your project managers, right? And they come in and go, hey, I want a pen test, but can we get one for 500 bucks? Like, what kind of pen test will we get for 500 bucks? <laughs> or, no, no, actually, we'll do it in two days. We'll do the pen test in two days. No, three days. No, no one, one and a half days. We'll settle it two days. And I'm like, why don't we do the penetration test based on risk? Why don't, we <laughs> why don't we actually scope it up and find out what matters? These folks are incentivized on delivery, and I do understand, you know, we do need to understand this, but we do need to also, you know, hop back over the fence and say, hey, look, the penetration test has got to be based on risk. It's got to be based on us understanding what matters and what would hurt us if, if you know, these things were to come to fruition. Our poor friends are developers. <laughs> They're really nervous, like, really, really nervous. Understand that they're being audited and, and reviewed on something that they may not have even been trained on. I've walked into rooms and gone, who knows what the EOS top 10 is or who could walk me through the EOS 10 and no one's put their hands up. And yet, you know, this is, this is what's happened. Or worse, and this has happened, developers have gone, yeah, we'll, we'll deploy a build to production and they won't find anything because I've turned off all the shit that's probably going to break. <laughs> I'm like, team, team, come on, this is like, hiding a golf ball sized tumor from your doctor like don't <laughs> don't don't do this no you, you know it it's how it's helped me give a stable build to pen testers time and time again by actually asking devs like is this production representative is this what needs to happen and i see a bit of minimizing they're like last minute they've realized they're about to have a pen test so that everyone gets bought hard hats and we use we find out what the frameworks can do for security and it's all just crammed in the last minute <sighs> You know, security's been in a bit off, like, relax, we've got hard hats, nothing can go wrong. Um, in setting up the engagement, you know, has anybody talked to the QAs? <laughs> the, QAs the QAs know where the bodies are buried, <laughs> usually, you know. Um, have you actually got everybody in the team to talk to each other and whatever else? And very, you know, lastly, it's the preemptive flame strike. It's like, yeah, this is going to be a total mess, but it's ops fault. Or it's the API team's fault, it's whatever else, and they're going, oh, shit, I didn't know. And they're looking at all the stuff that, that this is connected with and whatever else. So pen testers, like, if you're dropping into a team and you're about to start an engagement with people that are feeling like this, like they're under a crunch, do you think you're going to get <laughs> the really good quality information in the context to do your job well? Like, what kind of handover are you actually going to get? And it just, I, you know, more often than not, I see it being the bare minimums that, that your, in, your engagement men are asked for. And he said, here's the URL, here's the source code, here's some creds. Crack into it. Tell us in five weeks. 
or you know, two weeks or whatever else, and your pen testers wait for the buzzer to start before they can start kind of punching the snot out of it. This is, this is yeah. The pre-testing requirements are, are light. The setup is a shambles. Sometimes the test scope is wrong. Sometimes during an engagement, like the security controls, you know, kind of maybe do work and or, or they're testing the wrong part of the system or whatever else. The support is not there for the penetration testers. They sit there going, well, we're waiting for you to fix your thing or, or set things up um, or course correct us directly where we, where we do need to go. And everything that follows. And the result is sometimes you get a report that you go, like, what did you guys actually look at? Or what about this? What about that? Um, this, this, this way of doing this work is just, it's just does, it's not working well. This is a horrible way to operate. Like, this is a really horrible way to operate. So how can we fix this? This is, this is, this is the, the actionable advice that I want to give you when you go away and work with your teams. I want you to bring these guys in as part of your team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Get you a graphics designer that understands your aesthetic, okay? Um, <laughs> This is it. Every, a lot of the problems that we've solved with this shift left, with DevOps culture, everything else, is getting people talking to each other and whatever else. Yes, you've got pen testers that are remote, but you can talk to them, you can video conference, you can do a whole bunch of other things. Let's, let, let's actually go you know, through some of those that, that worked. Um, and it's a bit of a mind shift, I guess. So we're bringing them closer together, we're making sure we get the right context and support and scope and everything else. Um, and making sure that you know you understand what matters. Um, penetration testers get the mindset that you're dropping in on this team, giving them some assurance, and like, tell me what you've built, not just the technical, the business. Give me the give me the full download, and then I'm going to get some assurance with you together. I, I'm not your adversary. I'm not your enemy. I'm part of your team, and we're going to help make sure this what you ship next is 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 good and secure. Engineers, pen testers are not your enemy. They're your teammates. Help your teammates. Make, help them do good security testing. You, you, you want them to succeed because you want to build secure software too and you want to learn from them and the things that they find. So when you're scoping an engagement, um, I strongly suggest making a good use of a kickoff call. Get the, get the mutual understanding, the business and the technical. Um, if you're struggling with that, let your engagement manager or your client contact know um, and see if they can thrash out ways to like make these meetings less painful. Um, understand that when you do an engagement with pen testers, you don't ring up and say, you don't kind of just leave your software on the doorstep and meekly run away <laughs> and hope it doesn't come back too battered. You can do a lot of non-standard things. Like you can say, hey, we're building a new risky feature set or we're building something that I'm not entirely sure about. Um, I want you to come in and do a secure code review at 20% of the way through the project or when these foundational stuff are done, maybe, in, maybe a check at 80% or whatever else. But don't just ring up and say, I'm here to tick the security box. Work out what would be the most meaningful way to, to go through what you're, what you're building. Um, for the, for the engineers and pen testers, get good at asking leading questions, like what are the most important aspects of the system? Um, what are the, you know, ask them, what are the first things you're gonna attack and why? Um, what, is there anything else I should know? You know get good at asking some leading questions. Um, for teams that are kind of a bit afraid of pen testers or don't really understand penetration testing, the number one thing I've done to help correct this is bringing the pen testers on site. And I know the pen testers are going on site, but <laughs> <laughs> try and make, when you bring pen testers on site, make sure you give them good gear and another quiet space and you know, try and make it as good as, as, as good as you can. But bringing the pen testers on site and bedding them in within the teams, like you, cl you get the fastest feedback loops ever and the teams have the best access to each other. And towards the end, like really new teams were like, what penetration testers do is actually very similar to what our QA is doing. I'm like, yes, you're very similar. This is a part of the sports team that, you know, you haven't dealt with before, but they're very much part of what you do. Um, when the context is, when you're building a package for context, try and get it done early. Like, know the pen test is coming a month out and task somebody with 
getting all the right documentation package, early access to source code, open up the issue tracking, uh, like I already said, screen sharing, walk through the target application, maybe give them access to your test scripts, and early access to the environment so they can do a bit of exploratory testing. These are all things that give them a huge boost. Don't just do it the day before. Like, say, if you guys have got some prep time, we're going to give you everything to help make this as meaningful and as successful as we can. Um, so make sure you have a nominated support person in your team that helps them get unblocked. And you know, if they run into ops issues or need business context or whatever else, have somebody in their team put this in their calendar and treat it like a priority. Don't leave them sitting around waiting to do stuff. And when you go through the remediation, actually budget time for it. Um, defend your team's rights to use the penetration test report that you've been given to make changes, to roll it back into uh, coding standards. And if you can, if, if, the, if the penetration testers offer it, get the developers peer testing or walking through as they, as they regression test that stuff. And sharing is caring. Don't lock up these pen test reports because one team that makes one mistake is going to be made across all the other teams if you don't unlock these reports and share the learning. Make them available to your security guild um, or any development specialty groups that would want to read through and review it and discuss the findings across teams. So how do we know we're getting better? How do we, how do we actually see if you do these things, what would you see as sort of signs of success? Penetration testing's real value is being understood. Beyond the report, you're, you're getting learnings on how to, how to code more securely. So share that knowledge. It's going into your coding standards. It's becoming part of your continuous improvement. There's no more defensiveness around the results because you understand this is something that you do. Security is hard. Um, it is what it is, and you know the best, the best result you can is learn from the pen test, teach your fellow engineers, and come back stronger next time. It's you know, a big part of this not being adversarial is like we're more like sparring partners, come back stronger. Show the pen testers that you've understood their value and that you're gonna, you know, become a better team as a result. Um, as I say, findings land in code review. Engineers go off and hunt for similar or like bugs. That's a really a really important one. They're actually reading through the pen test report and going, oh, okay, that's you know, a thing that I should look for else and you know, maybe a bit of security guild swarm testing or group testing is uh is, is there. The pre-testing uh, requirements are not so hard to get. Once you get a team through it, they're like, oh, I'm about to have a pen test, so I will grab, bang, 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 bang. They'll, get, they'll give them a good package. And the frequency of those conversations between the pen testers and, and your team will, will increase. They won't be afraid of each other, and you can see those bridges being built, which is, uh, you know, positive. And overall, like, you do, you don't have weird stuff around reports, like, was the right thing covered or was it not? Because you've worked together on this. You've been partners in crime. You've, you've collaborated. Um, hopefully there's no, like, or there's less odd conversations around risk scoring and all that kind of stuff. And lastly, like, if your engineers ask for feedback from their pen testers or anything can do better, that's when you really know. They're like, they're, they want to do better. They want to work closer. So that's me. Those are the things I did to make penetration testing engagements better. If you have any questions, I don't think I've got time for that, but see me around today or at KiwiCon or whatever else, but thank you.